This is a, a terrific opportunity for the Robert Jackson Center to be part of a very special event. In fact, a few years ago, we at the Robert Jackson Center actually pulled together a booklet entitled Five Addresses by Robert H. Jackson to Swedish American Organizations. Yes, Jackson was not Swedish, but he wanted to be. So therefore, <laughs> he wrote a series of little sp speeches he gave to the Norton Club, gave to various Swedish chambers of commerce, went to Sweden, talked about Sweden. He, so he genuinely really wanted to be part of this and today. And as Julie said, what we have here today is an incredible opportunity for an interview. You're lucky. You're really lucky to have a chance for us to interview Peter Brenner. Peter Brenner was a product of the Liebensborn Project, a project which was initiated by Heinrich Himmler, a project which became really a concept of the Aryan race. You can see Peter, he's pretty well, you know, he's, you can see. Yo. And we'll talk about an incredible life journey here in just a second. However, I need to, for everybody to know how we got to here today. Yeah. And it's through Jerry Greenstein. Jerry Greenstein, Western New York audiologist extraordinaire. <laughs> Jerry's right here. And one of the things that Jerry had connected early on in his career was at Emerson College he was the college roommate of Peter Brenner. And it's Jerry who came to me at a local eating establishment, Los Sandros. I told to plug them today, too. <laughs> Where he came up and said, do you know, you have any idea about my college roommate who just wrote a book about a life's journey which you had very little knowledge of when you were at Emerson. And in fact, in what's critical why Jerry's in the front row right now, fact that he goes, when Peter and I were together for three years, I knew he was Norwegian, and occasionally on evenings, Saturday evenings, he would talk, and he would talk fast, and I never understood him. So, Jerry, as a thank you, as just a little bit of a thank you from us to you for making this possible, I found last night the Children's Illustrated Norwegian Dictionary, to which you now have can convert some of the conversations you had with Peter, which presumably were in Norwegian late at night, into English. So, Jerry, congratulations. You're welcome. Wow. Here we are, Peter, because of Jerry. Little yes. did you realize. I did not realize that. By, by the way, it's Dr. Peter Brenner, for those interested. And just for biographical purposes, he holds a a uh, Master of Divinity degree from Hartford Seminary, a Doctor of Ministry from Chicago Theological Seminary. He's retired from his careers as a Congregational Minister and a Commander in the U.S. Navy. That alone is worthy of conversation. But we're not going to talk about that. This all starts this incredible life's journey, and it's a History Channel lesson. We're, we're filming this. I'm not sure what we'll do with this, Peter, and I'm not sure you'll even authorize it when we get done. <laughs> Nevertheless, we figured it'd be easier just to film it and beg forgiveness later. Can I wave to my friends? Yeah. <laughs> so, it really starts with many serendipitous moments, Peter, and you've used the term throughout your book, and by the way, the book is available right afterwards. If you didn't get it beforehand, don't miss it. It's an incredible read. Um, you used a term that I've never heard before called God winks. Yes. What word did you refer to, and how does that sort of play into some of your journey as we kind of set off on it? The, the reason I use the, the word God wink is because there are, I think all of us have had moments in our lives that we just can't understand how they happened or how we survived or why we made it to the next moment. Usually it's uh, predicated on something bad, but it can also be predicated on something good. And I use God wink as saying there are, in our normal journey through life, you can hear the, the theology coming out of me here now, but as I'm going through my life, there are times that I need more than just what I can do to help me get through the moments. And God wink 
is when God comes down <clears throat> and intervenes and interrupts your life to help you. As you, we hearken into the book uh, which we have here. By the way, it's called Behind the Smile. And you can see that ever, effervescent a smile of Peter Brenner's, as we see. And it's called Orphaned by Hitler's Madness. Orphaned by Hitler's Madness. And that's the Liebensborn program. When did you get your first sense that perhaps you, well, one, that you were adopted? I think the adoption was not, not a problem because uh, I was in the program <clears throat> in orphanages uh, from the first week that I was taken away from my mother and for five years. And there were three different uh, children's homes or three different orphanages. So I was very aware that I was in an orphanage. But what I wasn't aware of is, is that you could have a, a parents. And then when I was five years old, my, my parents who could not my mom and dad, who could not bear children, were visiting uh, orphanages. And they were at one orphanage called Imprint. It was the third one that I was in. It is a Walt Disney setting. If I were to tell you I had a hard time and took you to there, you would say I was lying and I should have been uh, had all ten years of my life there instead of just five. A beautiful, idyllic place on Kem C. I don't know if anybody has been in Germany to Kem C. You know, Ludwig's great castle in the middle of it. Well, her place is on the shore of Kempsey. And it was there that uh, I uh, was found by my, my parents that would be uh, adopting me. And of course, that was, you know, like moment change for me. Peter, uh, you really started that life journey because it's, in many senses, like roots. At some point, you had an aha moment with your wife, Bonnie, who's sitting right next to Jerry. You're judged by the company you keep, Bonnie. I just want you to know there's a lot of people in here. Uh, but there was an aha moment saying, I really want to know more about where I came. Your, your adoptive parents had give, told you that you were adopted, and but you didn't know that much about it. And at some point, you had to start out. And I use the year 2000, I think that was about the time period. Yes, about, about the two year, year 2000. I think uh, I, I did not talk about or understand my past, but I was revealed to them uh, in dreams. And uh, they were not the best kinds of dreams. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I would take a, a deep breath after I wake up in the morning and say, okay, that's fine, and, you know, we'll, we'll see how life goes. And after a while, uh, it, there was just the idea that I needed to, uh, I had ignored my roots, you know, I just wasn't interested in exploring them. And then there was a point where when I was older, of course, uh, Bonnie and I were going to visit Germany, and I wanted to visit some of the places that I knew I had at the orphanage, especially in Cream. And it was then that I decided I needed to know more about who I was. And I think I referred to those five years as a black hole. I think I, and, and that's what it was. It was just a, it was a black hole. I didn't want to go into it. So Bonnie and I decided we were going to go uh, to Europe for a trip. And uh, you know, the agenda was to visit the orphanages. And that, began, that gave me the courage uh, to begin exploring as I saw the places, learned more about them, and wanted to know <clears throat> more about my, my past. My natural mother never told me much about it. I mean, I knew her for several years. She just died a terribly long time ago. But it's one of those things, as you understand that uh, if any of you that might have been at a war, gone through a war, you'll find out they don't talk about it when they come home. And so she didn't talk about those bad years. And, what I began to find out about, I didn't talk about him. I knew Jerry was my closest friend and he didn't know about it. Because I just didn't share it. And, but eventually I found out I had to. And so I did. And as part of that life journey, what you did know, did you know in the year 2000 about your natural mother? Did you know who she was? Had she been identified to you? She had. And the reason being is my father, uh, my dad I should say, 
let's, let's make a distinction between my mom and dad brought me up. Uh, my, my father I didn't know at all, and my mother was BJ, the, the one that I didn't know. And uh, re repeat the Well, question. whether you had, you had met her or been revealed to, that she lived in America. Right. And uh, did you know before the year 2000 when you started to go out? Well, my, my, uh, my, I, I took a trip out uh, with two of my best fraternity brothers. And uh, it was at that time that I had decided... Uh, and that included Jerry. <laughs> yeah, but he, was, he was part of that group too. We'll talk about that later. Jerry and uh, Steve Bolton. Uh, and we took a trip, and it's the kind of trips that uh, uh, every young bachelor wants to take before they know they're going to find a beautiful wife and, and, and spend time and bring up a family. So we had... Uh, don't worry, Jerry, I won't say everything about the trip. Uh, we, we, but we had a great trip, and part of that trip included when I got to California, my parents had always told me from day one that I was adopted. And from day one, they told me that, uh, that I would be able to meet my natural mother. They never hid it from me. It wasn't one of these secret things I discovered all of a sudden. And so on this trip going out to California with Jerry and Steve, I decided that I was going to visit her. Excuse me. We were in California, and you know this is important because they were going to a baseball game. And they must have realized something was happening because I said I wasn't going to go to the baseball game. And that never happens. And, uh, and then I just, just to say is I went and I saw in Riverside, California. Did by way of background, and I think to set the stage, you, at age eight, at age eight, your father, sure, your, your dad, and mother, want, mom wanted to, to become, have you become naturalized. And as a result of that, the America required the consent of the natural mother and isn't it at that point where, in fact, uh, Arthur, as she was at, who was your uh, adopted father, um, reached out and actually found her? Yeah, and see, uh, I'll make this brief, really, but it's a very important uh, point, is that uh, for me to become adopted, I needed to the signature and approval from my actual national mother. I don't know if they do that today or not, but that's what had to happen. And my, my dad said they found a baby and we would like you to help us in that. And she had thought, and I, I'm, we'll see if I could ever tell that story here, I'm not sure, but she uh, had, my dad had found out, she had known me and uh, had met with, known me as a child, but she thought that I had died uh, because of a bomb in a certain area. I didn't. And so as far as she was concerned, uh, I had already, her child was dead. So when she had the opportunity to help this chaplain, who was a wonderful uh, chaplain for them, uh, she said, sure, I'll sign it. And, uh, and so that's what happened. She, she said, I'm the natural mother of the child that you want. Here, I'll sign whatever you want me to sign. They signed it, and that allowed me to get adopted by American parents. Again, a little, for, uh, you got to read the book. Let me just underscore that. You've got to read the book because we're going to just hit certain vignettes. But historically, what happened was that Peter was at an orphanage which was bombed. And a number of the children who were at that location died due to concussions. And the group and buried in groups, in a group grave there. And I think it was your... Natural mother assumed you were one of them. It was in Nordrock. That was the first door. Sure. And that's where you were born. Yeah, uh, that was where I was born. It's uh, it's again. I, I had these great places I was at as a, as an orphan. As Nordrock is located on the south uh, west corner of the Black Forest, and it's the area where you know of Hansel and Gretel. So you know how beautiful that place is. That that was this terrible, agonizing place that I was at as I was an orphan. That's a very first one. So, again, from a historical perspective, she deems, or she's concerned, you were one of that 
her child was in that group grave. She hears from this chaplain who says, no, that's not the case. I'm sure she's in a state of disbelief and signs. Is it during this California trip? Is that your first visit with her? That's the, that's the first time I visited her. Right. That was the first time I had a chance to see her. See her, and of course, I it was exciting for me because she was a strongest, which is my Norwegian name, and uh, got her strongest. And uh, there were connect she had children, uh, and other children, and they must have gotten her side of the genes because I got her side of the genes, so you could see the resemblance, and then that's what she knew that you walk into the room and see her for the first time. What you feel like? Well, I was trying to avoid as much as I can, like I'm trying to do right now, uh, trying to avoid uh, addressing it. So I, went, I said, can I swim in the swimming pool? <laughs> and I did. And I don't know that we talked about it a lot. Uh, it, we just, we verified the fact that I was the son and she was the mother. Uh, I don't know if it's in the book, I mean, I may blown right back, but my wife picked up on the question. This is part of the History Channel. You can't believe this stuff. Your chaplain adoptive father married, conducted the cer wedding ceremony of your natural mother to Hunter Johnson, right? They, uh, if I can't get through this, there, there's, you, you have to know the parts of it that kind of get hard to talk about. So I'll, I'll recruit Bonnie because she knows the story as well as I do. <laughs> But uh, what, what in the book, so you have to buy the book to see the picture. I won't give it to you otherwise. In the book, I have a picture. And in that picture, uh, my father is doing a wedding ceremony for uh, a Norwegian. Oh, you'll see. A, Nor a Norwegian woman who was going to marry uh, an a officer, an American officer. You know them as the war brides. And <clears throat> so. Uh, we got that picture, and that picture has my father doing the wedding for my natural mother to an American uh, officer. Uh, when I went to visit, having to, you know, in, from California, what I am, who I am visiting, is the couple that was being married that had been married by my father. You then embark on this. 2000, year 2000, life journey, an odyssey. Uh, you are, and you got to read the book. Did I say that yet? You've got to read the book. Because there's a lot of steps, a lot of serendipity, and the term you use, God winks, along the way which take you down a path. But ultimately it takes you back to the orphanage and you meet an individual, well, you talk about it. Her name is Tante. Yeah, Tante, Tante, Tante Morella. Um, there was another one, when we went in North Park, we were walking up and down the street after we'd gone to uh, a bookstore to pick up areas about North Rock, and we met a gentleman uh, who was there when I was there, which was, which, which was kind of a serendipitous moment too, and verified uh, where we stay, verified the bombings, and verified uh, what so many children survived, what few children survived. Uh, and then Tanta Morella is the third orphanage. Uh, it's North Rock, Steinherring, which is close to Munich, and then this beautiful one in Heron Kim C. And uh, she, she would go around and select I don't know how she picked the kids up. I don't know how she picked up what she did. But she never had more than six or seven children because that way she could take care of them. I don't think she had a husband. I never saw the husband or wasn't alive when we were there. And so she would then treat and take care of all those children as though they were her own. And uh, she was a life jacket. For all of us that were there, she was a life jacket. And that's the location that you were taken after Nordic had been bombed. Uh, no, when I went after Nord Nordrock, which was the first Nordrock. year, I went to Steinherring. Steinherring 
is where uh, Heinrich Himmler had put together a facility because he had gotten the beckoning command by Hitler to have a place where they could uh, institute the Lebensborn program. Uh, the, uh, and the Lebensborn program was to genetically engineer a more perfect race. And so they would uh, kidnap, steal, take away from others uh, children that were uh, of Nordic descent or blonde and, and blonde and blue eyed. Kids running around. So 
They were very nondescriptive and very hidden from, from the people. I don't know if I've gone off on what you asked or not, but uh, th that's the setting of the three areas that I was in. It was a total accumulation of uh, about five years from, uh, you know, birth, one week taken away from the mother, and then going to the three orphanages and then being adopted and coming to America. Talking about your mother, to, to get there, uh, your mother and her family lived near Oslo, and she met a man who's been a Frank, uh, became pregnant. And this is a time, and I think this is history lesson. Keep in mind that the Germans had already occupied uh, Norway. Remember Quisling? Remember Quisling? He instituted various programs, and it was during that time that your mother and some of her friends and family were part of the Norwegian resistance. So again, go to your history channel, watch the Norwegian resistance process, and Bjork, uh, known as BJ, uh, Peter's natural mother, was part of that. And uh, she became pregnant. And because of the Norway, Norway relationships with Germany during that occupation, then she went with a friend to Germany to have you. Um, and again, I don't wanna, there's a lot in the book here, but it was there that I guess she worked, when she came to Norway, she worked for a uh, German officer, right? Yeah, I, I, I think I have to, uh, I guess in defense of my natural mother, uh, I think she was very naive. If I can use that, she's 16 years old. Uh, I don't know how old Frank was. He probably was somewhere in a similar area. Uh, and as you had alluded to, uh, the first time military ever had land, sea, and air on an exercise to overtake an area was when they took over uh, Norway, when the Oslo. Of all the wars that we had, it's the first time that all three elements were used to. And that shows you how important it was for Hitler to to uh, have Norway under under the control under his control. I think my mother was very. I think she was very innocent, very naive. To be perfectly honest with you. And somehow she felt that with a girlfriend and herself, they could leave. Uh, there was not much food. Uh, shoes and heavy coats were all taken away from the Norwegians in the winter. <coughs> And so under those circumstances, she decided uh, to, to, <laughs> to go to greener pastures, if we can say that. And she went to around the Munich, Germany. And uh, she was attractive. And uh, there was a German officer that had been maligned or uh, maimed. And Hitler wasn't any easier on his officers. And if you weren't fit and ready to go, and you were, could, if you limped too much or you had a hand that was blown off, you were relegated to some other role. You didn't get rid of you, but you were relegated to some other role. And that was the family that I was put in, that she was put into. She was put into that family. And it's because it was a German officer, he knew of Nordrock. Did, obviously, your mother was Norwegian, and they put folks into the Liebensborn, Liebensborn program if there was a identification of the uh, purity of the race. Uh, Very complicated. In fact, I, I can't even tell you all this. this now he's saying, read the book. If you want to know what the criteria was, uh, you need to read the book. It's quite a criteria that was used for uh, what was uh, uh, genetically pure. And, uh, you know, she had to be blonde, healthy, blue-eyed, and goes on and on. It was pretty pretty strict, and uh, once you fell into that category, uh, you know, you were in his grips. So she's placed in uh, the location, she has you, and then shortly thereafter, you're taken away. Right, I'm taken away from from her, and she doesn't realize this is in North Rock. She's told this is a wonderful place for, I mean, she was this, you know, 16 years old. She couldn't take care of a baby in the war, <clears throat> you know, it was 1944. 
So that was where they recommended, and I don't know how she got there, but she went there. And when she went in there and uh, presented her child for care, uh, they took me away from her and sent her away. Did she unable, see? Unable to go back. She paid people money, and she, there is a picture in there where you see some. You see a picture of a little baby uh, in there, and uh, she did have a chance to go in and take a picture of me and see me uh, once or a couple of times. She said, but then after that, the doors were shut. And she couldn't see me again, and that's later on because of the bombing of that town. As I told you, Nordberg, we alluded to it earlier, because of the bombing. Actually, interestingly enough, is Allied bombings because it's right close to the. <clears throat> right close to France. So the, the bombings <clears throat> from the Allied bombing were what uh, blew out the eardrums for little kids, uh, babies. When you went back there in 2000 and worked your way to that location, um, is there a mass grave and, uh, at that location? And how did you feel? I mean, you're one of those that survived. One of the few, by the way. Uh, there's a mass grave. I don't know where like what you hear, you know, the horse, the horse stories. As you were walking through this, uh, and again, back in 2000 when you're in this journey, you ultimately find your, a lot of data uh, with regards to yourself, whether it's microfilm, whether it's this. Uh, one of the things the Germans, they did anything, they did an awful lot of documentation. And at some point, you, you're flipping through microfilm and you see yourself. Because there's a piece of your life which is in the black hole. And all of a sudden, you, through your pertinacity, actually want to learn more and you find it. Yeah, through the, through the experiences. It's not like I saw a film or something like that, but it's through the experiences that I knew that uh, I came from uh, that background and those places, and I knew it, it was verified by my going to And in Steinhering, the, you know, uh, the Germans are uh, meticulous for keeping records. and. Uh, we went into, we had an excellent person, a banker that was there, and took us to, uh, to see the mayor, and we went through some documents uh, that were uh, of all the people, and uh, it was in a document. When you came to America at age five, uh, you were met by a chaplain. I don't know if we've talked about the fact. Tell, tell them about your adoptive family. That's good. I, that's a little easier, folks. <laughs> <clears throat> my uh, my adoptive parents. <clears throat> my my mother was un unable to uh, bear bear a child, and uh, so they were looking around to try to find children that they could adopt. And he was stationed during the occupation. Anybody here from World War II? Anybody that went to the occupation afterwards? A lot of a lot of the people would go visit the orphanages in the hopes of finding a child. They knew they couldn't make or have children, so they, they started looking around. And that and that's how they went uh, to the various orphanages and you know went around and finally saw this handsome, wonderful, scrawny little kid. And said, "Oh, that's that's the one. He'll be a star baseball player and a brilliant uh, combating uh, Einstein and all that stuff." And so you can see why he immediately adopted me. <laughs> then you actually take a boat ride over uh, from Norway to America. You land in America. You're greeted by them, and uh, they give you something special when you arrive. Yeah, actually, it was a plane. It was a plane. Yeah, I, I, I flew in a plane, uh, and and uh, on on the plane, I might add, I was given red shoes, uh, which I really liked. And I wore red shoes, and uh, this is the uh, airline stewardess that was very motherly for me, which was really very important to be able to be home. But we came, I, we came into New York, and <clears throat> and uh, my father was stationed in. Wrightstown, Wrightstown, and you might also know as, as McGuire, uh, big air base area, and uh, he was going to be the base chaplain, which was as a very young chaplain, and as I said, they were unable to bear children. So when I uh, uh, landed, uh, 
they were the ones that gave me the, the red shoe because I, I had mixed up a little bit. The stewardess had red shoes and I liked her shoes. That's what it was. And when I came back, I, I said that. I think I said, do you have red shoes or something? <laughs> At least that's what they're, I'm told. I said, and so they bought me red shoes. And, uh, and then they drove down to uh, Wrightstown or from New York where the plane landed. And they, we were in a trailer park. And then from the trailer park, we went into base housing. And then I was there about three years with a nice, strong German accent. Uh, and all German, because I didn't know any English. Luckily, my dad spoke excellent German, and my mother was quite good at it. And uh, I had, I'm going to kind of proceed a little bit. But because I, you can be, imagine being on a base right after World War II, and all you do is speak German. <laughs> That's when I understood bullying. <laughs> also, when you lost your accent, probably pretty fast. As quickly as I could. I, I, had to, I learned American English probably quicker than anybody ever had in the world had. Didn't your parents also give you uh, a doll called Curious George? Yes, and I, and I still have it. It's on the end of my bed. And, uh, and, uh, I can't lose that. Bonnie's confirming that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a late 60s holding on to a little stuffed uh, monkey. <laughs> There's got to be something wrong with me there too, you know. But uh, no, it's, it's a precious gift and I still have it. I'm going to digress for just a minute. This is more of a Robert Jackson center moment. Because your uh, adoptive uh, father, chaplain, mother, went peripatetic, they went all over the place. I mean, you were typical military child but one of your places ended up in montgomery montgomery alabama and just digress quickly that the robert jackson center robert jackson was a justice of the united states supreme court was involved in brown versus board of education we've had at the jackson center james meredith linda brown uh john Doerr, a lot of people who were involved in the civil rights movement john lewis um, you also were, had a little piece of that puzzle while you were in Montgomery, in Rosa Parks. Yeah, in a, in a sense that I was I was there uh, when Rosa Parks uh, sat on the bus, and you know, and all the whole thing about the bus. Uh, and Martin Luther King used that as a focal point for you know equality for all people. And there's Montgomery, Alabama. You actually, uh, at least in your book, question. Uh, your dad probably about the fact that you were writing with black students at the time and you wondered what the fuss was. Yeah, because I, I we had, in, in the military, you, you learn to make friends quickly. And you really don't, <clears throat> you really don't care if they're uh, black, orange, purple, ink, whatever. Just, if they smile at you and they're willing to talk to you, you've got a friend. And I think that's pretty much, I mean, I, I know there are all kinds of personalities in the military, but when you travel, as much as it, I was never any place more than a year and a half, ever. So you make friends quickly. Okay. Now back on your journey, journeys. I guess you went there twice. Uh, years 2000, and then you go back in 2006 to Germany as well. Or is that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, were there moments during those two time periods where you? Couldn't help but look skyward and say, God waits a divine intervention that it was meant to be for you to find things out that maybe you didn't want to know, but nevertheless you knew you now know. Yeah, I, I think you you captured that very well. And not only that, I think it's uh, that period of time that really precipitated my one going into ministry because I just thought there was there had to be something theological about what was happening to me. And I needed to understand a little bit more divine intervention, God winks, all those fancy words that we try to use and nobody understands us, you know. And but we struggle with those words, those theological words. And I and I knew that was part of my uh, unlocking uh, my past, trying to find more about who I was. Now that you found out more about who you are, uh, you manifested, memorialized this in a book. Uh, how difficult was all that to, to, to relive? Books are tough to do. And 
you've obviously captured something incredible in your life journey of self, your journey of self-discovery. Uh, how difficult was it? I, I don't think I could have done it without the support and the insistence of money. The black hole too scary. I don't know if we, I end up crossing the line if it, if it gets too personal. It's in the book, by the way. Uh, but you you mentioned it early on that uh, did we lose our sound here. I didn't touch it. <laughs> there you go. Uh, was the fact that you had some scary dreams along the way, and you mentioned it throughout the book. Sort of like the same dream uh, in a car with two women. Um, you explain it in the book. Do you want to explain it now? No, I can't. Okay. Uh, read the book. <laughs> read the book. If you know there's a mantra. i got to tell you, this is perhaps, I've done probably a thousand interviews. This is probably as moving uh, an opportunity, Peter. And I know how difficult this is. Uh, the fact that you got here, you're willing to, frankly, go out of your comfort zone today. And you must know this. He wasn't quite prepared, even though, for the interview part of this. He's got a presentation, and I highly, highly recommend you come and watch his presentation at 2 o'clock tomorrow. This is different today. This is me coming and having an opportunity to talk to him. And therefore, unlike a presentation where you're prepared and you know where you're going... Uh, I, I can't help but thank you for permitting me to go to areas which might be uh, outside that comfort zone and to share that with this incredible uh, folks who also are fellow Scandinavians. I didn't have, a, I didn't have the opportunity to edit his questions. <laughs> and many of them would not have been asked. But, uh, I'm glad you bear it with me and I'm glad you asked them. Before I, uh, do we have time? I've kind of lost track. I don't have a clock. You've got 15 minutes. 15 minutes. We have 15 minutes for questions. That's my mother, by the way, who's bearing in on us right now, Peter. Yeah. Wow. This is so tough to have her so close. So, just a, uh, one of the, one of the, you know your dad had been very, obviously, interested in Orphans interested obviously in you. He became uh, the uh, attention uh, for lifelong. But at the same time, he spent some time away in the Orient, and I think that's you conclude in a concluding chapter about some of the revelations you found out about your chaplain adoptive father. Yeah, my father, uh, I think I was new. He kind of had it in, in his portfolio to do wherever he went. But what he did is he started uh, the Brenner Onyang Orphanage in, in Korea. And Bonnie and I just a few years ago went over there to do uh, ministry with the children there. And what was so fascinating about it is that at this age, this was just a few years ago, you know, uh, that he went over to this uh, Renner Orphanage. And I'll read this. My dad knew one day I would visit, is it the Anyang? Anyang. Anyang Renner Orphanage. Behind my smile reside, resided a genuine positive spirit. Behind my smile rests a person at peace with his past. This is, this is his conclusion. My journey of self-discovery has made a major difference in my life. The secrets that hobble forth from my forgotten region of pain, confusion, shame, and ridicule have been recast. I am no longer a slave to my past. I am, in part, the architect of my future. My mind is filled with clarity of purpose, honor, confidence, and self-assurance. I pray each of you may be so richly blessed. Does that capture it? I'm going to ask that you give him an applause, and then we'll stay around for a Q&A. Peter
now uh, Q and A. I guess. Good luck. Red Sox question first. <laughs> Red Sox question Red first. Sox, okay. That's my comfort zone. Okay. Yeah. How about those Red Sox? Right. Where do you live now? We're we're on Cape Cod. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so so, so if, if you were feeling sorry for me, don't. We're in Cape Cod. We have a beautiful home that my parents had, and when they passed away, we inherited it. And uh, we love that. I'm a New Englander, pretty much. Even though I traveled a great deal, once I got married, we sort of settled in the New England area. And I always liked Cape Cod, and it's a, it's a wonderful place. So it's. Uh, remember Peter Brenner and Bonnie Brenner, look in the phone book, and if you are uh, in the neighborhood, uh, unless the rooms are all full, let me know and we'll talk or we can stay with them. Where were you in 2004 when the Boston Red Sox won their first world championship? <laughs> let me think. <laughs> I was in Boston. I was in Boston. I wish I had a ticket to the game, but I didn't. But, uh, anybody that was a Red Sox fan, just we were doing cartwheels. And, all our Yankee you know, friends we had disappeared and weren't anywhere near us, except for the real good ones. And they actually came up and shoulders were humped and said, all right, you'll like some. <laughs> yeah. Then reminded you, it's the first time since 1918 that you'd won, right? Another a question. How'd you meet Bonnie? Bonnie and I... Well, the question was, wait, we want to repeat the question. Please. Oh, uh, how'd you meet Bonnie? So I'm taking a break. <laughs> this is Bonnie. How did you meet Peter? You know, let's do that for a second. Can, you know, really, I want to know. She's what, very articulate. I don't know why. Bonnie, she's doing she's got, yeah, because I want to know what, what you. Go ahead. There's a question. What you see in this guy? <laughs> the Aryan race. I know. Well, we uh, we were working uh, for the uh, Christian Ministries in the National Park, and it was a worker priest concept. And I uh, am a music teacher, and so I was training to become a music teacher. And um, I was involved in the music ministry, and I was a maid. I made 50 beds a day in Yosemite Lodge. And because I was part of the uh, ministry program, that Peter was a chaplain in the hospital, and he uh, was a gas attendant in the uh, village, we met because we had um, staff meetings for the ministry. So I met him on a Friday the 13th at a campfire in Yosemite National Park. So I thought, whoa, this is a god week. This is pretty nice. <laughs> and by the end of the summer in August, he had proposed to me. And uh, we were married the following June pretty fast at age 21. <laughs> oh, 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 stay right there. Stay right there. Uh, I have a question. Um, do you want to respond? Is that your story? He's close, close enough. Close enough. <laughs> He goes off on, uh, he, could, he attributes to you the facilitation of this journey. At what point did you go, this is, this is something worthwhile, I mean, you must have questioned whether or not this was good for him. Well, when we were dating during those uh, three months in Yosemite, he did share with me about his mother and the whole adoption. First time. The first time. And uh, he, we had, he actually went down to visit her, um, and then we uh, connected in LA and went to Disneyland together. <laughs> but um, um, I just felt that uh, the Leiden's Farm program is a, something that many people know about, um, and it's part of history that I think that you know, lest we forget, it's part of the Holocaust that needs to be told. And I felt that it needed to be written down somewhere. And I think even deep down that Peter is even searching to see if he could find those seven children that he was in pre, you know, to keep together. So that's why, you can see we're a great couple, we cry together. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I felt that he needed to write this uh, for posterity to have it. Um, last summer we went to the Holocaust Museum the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., and he uh, gave one of his books to the library there, and they were so happy to have it because it was in English. All the books that they had were in German, and as Americans, we, we don't know about this program. So uh, there was also a Godwink because of, uh, I was a music teacher in Simsbury, Connecticut, 
and there was this woman outside my door reading in German to her five-year-old who was there for speech therapy. And we needed to have some documents translated precisely in German because Peter, you know, knew German, but he kind of lost a little bit of it. And so she took these documents and translated them for us. And um, to this day, she said, she said to me at the end, she said, you know, I'm not supposed to be in this building, but I know now why I had to come to this building, because I needed to translate these documents for you. Because we were telling her we were going on um, his sabbatical and we were going to uncover some of these things. And she said, you're going to have a hard time finding it out because the Germans are not going to talk about it. And even when we were in Stein Herring and Peter saw that his name was listed in the Lebensborn, which was an absolute shock to him that he was part of that program. It wasn't until 06 that he knew that he was part of that program. We said, can we have this copied so we could have this? And they said, no, this is documents here. It stays here. So, you know, it, it, it was an embarrassment for the Germans. And these poor children, after the war was over, nobody wanted them. So that was a real God week. I, you know, there we go. Yes. We have a friend who uh, was in Norway during the war and has been involved in the George Marshall Center for 25 years because she said he saved us from starving and freezing to death. How did your mother get out of Oslo when so many couldn't? Well, you know, the, the town that she, was, that she lived in was in Frederikstad. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Frederikstad, uh, it, it's, this shows you that Swedes and Norwegians can get along. <laughs> it's like four miles. It's the most narrow point between, you know, the Oslo the water to uh, Sweden. So, uh, it was not hard for her, it would be very easy for her to, to slip over to Sweden, for example, and so it's four miles away. Or if she went south, it was really pretty close before you got to the water and you could go to uh, Denmark, so it wasn't really that hard. With that, we stand adjourned. I thank you to Peter Brenner. This has been an amazing moment in time. Thank you. Thank you.